Okay, so then let's continue with the next part for today, which is um, location. So first of all, I'd briefly like to talk about what location actually means in this context and what different types of location information we have. And then also about how you can determine the location of a mobile device. There's two major approaches. One is by using satellites and one is by using the networks it's connected to. And both have their advantages and drawbacks. So uh, from a very abstract point of view, if we talk about location, that just means the question, where am I? And if I, if, if I give you a map like this, then it would probably be pretty easy to sort of pinpoint that you're probably somewhere around here where that marker is. Um, but uh, this has different, different sub aspects. So maybe I want to know where I am myself and that usually translates to where my mobile device is right now. Or maybe I want to know where a specific uh, static object is. That can be a building, but it can also be a network server. So location can cover quite, quite different aspects. Um, maybe I want to know where another moving device is that can be a, a vehicle, or it might also be another mobile device. Um, and of course, there's the, the possibility that you want some combination of these questions answered. So what do you need that for? Of course, first idea most people have is something like location-based services. That means just give me the next, uh, show me the next five restaurants or something. But it can also be if you look at location from a network point of view, um, you might actually just want to know the network location of a specific object to deliver data to it. So a network location in this context means, for example, I want to know which access point uh, my Wi-Fi device is connected to because then I need to send my data to that access point. And it might mean something like navigation. So I want to know a route from my current location, for example, to one of the restaurants I just found. So these are also all quite different but related aspects of what location can, can actually mean. And it's not Maybe it's not always, that's important here, I think, it's not always physical location in terms of some coordinates, but it can also mean simply location in terms of the network. So where do I have to actually send my data that it comes out at the right, uh, right recipient? So for that reason, we can have different classes of location information. So we can have the purely geographical location in terms of latitude and longitude. Um, and if you look at, at old books or, uh, don't know, shipping routes and so on, then they're often given in degrees, hours, minutes, and seconds. And this is sort of outdated. So uh, in, in the context of mobile devices, location is usually given still in latitude and longitude and in degrees, but it's not anymore split into these, these hours, minutes, and seconds, but it's just fractions of a degree. So you get something like uh, these coordinates, and I think this is more or less the, the location where, where I'm standing right now. So when you have like uh, six or seven digits of precision for degrees of latitude and longitude, then that's below one meter of, of um, of precision actually. Different class of location would be topological information and that's something like a street address. And then of course you can have different, also different levels of granularity. You can have just the continent or you can have the building or maybe the room or maybe even a seat number. All of this is topological location information. And then finally, from the network point of view, we usually have cell-based location information. That means the ID, the MAC address, for example, of the access point I'm connected to, or the ID of the, the cell tower I'm currently connected to. Uh, so this is also location, but from a completely different point of view. So often, often you now have the uh, scenarios that you want a mapping between those two. Um, you have two of these classes. You have information from one class, but you actually want it in the other one. One example is you have um, topological information, like you know where you are or where a certain uh, restaurant, for example, is. 
and now you need the geographical location to actually show it on a map maybe. That's called uh, geocoding. So um, usually this, for example, the data in uh, Google Maps, OpenStreetMaps, whatever is uh, stored in a so-called graph database. So there, uh, from a very primitive point of view, every intersection is a node and every road is a connection between these points. And if I now put additional geographic information into each of these nodes, then I can approximate, for example, where, where a certain street address actually is. The other way around is um, so-called reverse geocoding, of course, so I know where I am in terms of geography. For example, I have GPS, which gives me coordinates, then I want to know, now I want to know the address. Um, for that to work, you need a, a so-called spatial index on the database, which helps you pinpoint the right node for, uh, for specific coordinates without having to search through the whole database uh, at once. And this will be covered in another lecture, but you can have basically both approaches. And uh, finally, if you now have the uh, network location in terms of a cell ID and want one of the other classes of information, which is also a scenario we often have, then you again need a second separate database which gives you the mapping between uh, the, for example, the MAC address of that router up there and where it's actually located physically. So most, most of the time that's the uh, geographic location stored somewhere in the database and then you can use that again to look up where, um, where you actually are in terms of street address, for example. All right, so brief summary of methods you can actually use to determine lo your location. We can use um, satellites, GPS, GLONASS, and so on. They are very accurate, down to maybe one meter, but they have a pretty high power draw when you turn on GPS, so your battery empties faster, and uh, it usually only works outside. Maybe it works when you're close to a window, but in general, um, the signal strength of the GPS satellites is so low that you just need to be outside for this to work. On the other hand, if you, if you use cell-based location using Wi-Fi, then we have a far lower power draw, but it's also less accurate. So it's maybe, in a very good case, down to 10 meters, but uh, probably um, not much less. And if you use cell towers, again, same trade-off. The cellular connection in your device is probably active anyway, so it's more or less no additional power draw, but the accuracy is even lower because the cells are bigger. We'll look into that in a moment. So the, the major trade-off here is between how accurate you want your location information and how much battery are you, you willing to spend to get it. Oops, wrong direction. Okay, so maybe one thing which, which uh, should be clarified also in this context is just one of terminology. So what's precision and what's accuracy? And I think this, uh, this graphic explains it pretty well. So if you have high precision, then you can repeat your measurements, for example, um, and get other measurements which are very close to the original value. So um, as long as the precision is high, all the measurements will basically stay close to, it, to each other. Um, if the accuracy is high, then um, your measurements will stay close to the uh, original, to, to the actual position uh, which you try to measure, regardless of what, uh, what method you use. Uh, same here, so the measurements with high accuracy are still close to the correct position, but in this case, for example, the precision is lower, so they're spread out farther. And on the other hand, if you have low accuracy, then you will have a, a systematic error between what you are measuring and what the actual value is. So for example, in terms of location, you will have some kind of offset in one direction. And the worst case, of course, is if you have low accuracy and low precision, um, because then not only will the measurements be spread out more widely, but they will also be offset from the, from the actual value by, by some, some kind of vector in that case. So 
just to keep in mind, uh, if we talk about precision and accuracy, it's not the same thing. It actually means two different aspects of the, of the uh, measurement itself. All right. So let's see. Okay. Um, now let's briefly talk about how satellite-based location actually works. Uh, I've already mentioned it has a pretty high power draw. Um, it needs a clear view of the sky. We, we have three different systems uh, currently in, in operation or in construction. We have GPS, of course, by the US. We have uh, GLONASS by Russia. And the uh, EU is trying to get uh, Galileo up and running. It's not quite there yet, but uh, I think it's pretty close to, to operation by now. So there's still a few satellites missing, but uh, it's pretty close. So um, I'm talking to, uh, about GPS now mostly, but uh, the principles are more or less the same for all the, of the three systems. You just have maybe different frequencies. So um, the, the important part is that you try to measure the time of flight a signal has from a satellite to your device. And if you do that for uh, four or five satellites at the same time, then you can get your actual location from that. Um, most devices which we have support at least two of those systems. Maybe if you get an upgrade at some time, they might even support Galileo 2. Um, so since they are so similar, you can actually build one single receiver which can deal with all, all uh, three of them. So to simplify uh, this a little, we have two satellites here and here. Then. Um, we measure the time it takes for the signal to travel to our receiver. So for each satellite, we get a, get a circle in this example. In reality, it's more of a sphere. And uh, at the intersection, there's, uh, there's our location. Problem, of course, is that you need to measure very, very small distances, and very small differences between the, the signal times because um, they travel at, travel at the speed of light, so 300,000 kilometers per second. And if you uh, move by one meter, then that's, I don't know, it's a difference of uh, 10 nanoseconds or something which you have to measure reliably. So um, if that happens, then um, you, of course, get something like this. So if you just have, like, 10% error, of course, that's an exaggeration, then um, the position you, you get from the calculation might move by quite a lot. So does anyone have a, a simple idea of how you could counter this problem? Yeah? Hmm? Still hmm? Yeah, of course. So you can add one more satellite, that's easy. Um, then even if you have this inaccuracy, then you can still triangulate between the, um, the, yeah, the three possible locations, basically, you, can, you get and still end up with a more or less um, precise point. Um, so to visualize this right now, uh, GPS uses 32 satellites, which are about 20,000 kilometer high in orbit. Um, and every point on Earth should uh, see, so if you have a, f a clear, unobstructed view of the sky, then you should always be able to uh, receive at least eight satellites. Of course, if you have buildings around you, then they will block the signal and the number goes down. Um, the important part is that you need at least four satellites, four receivable satellites to actually get a position fix. Does anybody have an idea why you need four and not three?